Good afternoon. This is December 11th, 2007. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Joan Craig, and our cameraman today is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We're privileged today to have David L. Jocelyn join us. Welcome, Dave. How are you? Very good, thank you. Thanks for coming in today. May I ask when and where you were born? Um, Natick, Massachusetts, December 13th, 1945. And you currently live in Natick? Yes. And married? Yeah, I'm married. And how many children do you have? Uh, none. And what was Natick like back in the 50s, that your youth in the 40s, 50s, and 60s? Peaceful and quiet. As opposed to current no. day? Correct. What kind of changes have you seen? Well, there's just a lot more buildings, and it um, seems like everybody has six cars instead of back in those days, we maybe had one and a half or a half a car. Um, so there's a lot more congestion, noise. Um, maybe people aren't quite as friendly as I remember them being growing up. Where and when did you enter the military? It was, um, let me see, November, no, I'm sorry, yeah, November um, 14th, 1966. Went into the Boston Army Base and then was um, bused to Fort Dix, New Jersey. Now, had you already graduated from Natick High School? Yes, I graduated in 1963, um, put some years into college, and um, then had started a job in June 66 and uh, got drafted. Didn't think I'd pass. I did. And now, why did you not think you would pass? Oh, I don't know. It's just common hope. <laughs> <laughs> So you were drafted in 66? Correct. Why did you, even though you were drafted, um, did you choose the Army? Yes, I went and enlisted because I uh, didn't want to go to Vietnam, so I figured if I got some schooling, I'd uh, probably have a better chance of staying stateside. Did any of your friends or family members also join at the same time? Um, a neighborhood buddy had joined maybe four months before that in the Air Force. Otherwise, um, that wasn't really an incentive. I did, didn't have too much choice. I was going one way or the other. And you went to Fort Dix yes. for your basic training. How long were you there for? Um, it was maybe around eight weeks. What was it like? Um, I didn't have any real problems with it. Uh, I was with a friendly, um, pretty much New Englanders or um, a lot of Massachusetts uh, fellows were in my uh, company. So um, we just always got along, did what we could to help each other. I think the worst part of it was I ended up in the uh, Fort Dix Army Hospital for nine days with what they called at that time up a respiratory infection. Was and it like a pneumonia or something of that well, nature? Sort of. I, I have um, bronchitis or asthma problems also, and I guess they were just not fully diagnosed then, and that was probably acting up. And they wouldn't really give you any medicine because you were supposed to develop antibodies and fight it on your own. Did you receive any type of specialized or advanced training during BASIC? Not during BASIC, no. And then how was it determined what you would do or where you would go next? Well, when I enlisted, I um, chose the uh, communications field. And they needed, um, at that time, 72,000 comm center specialists to fill their quota. And because I had some previous education and it was in the electromechanical field, they uh, said I'd fit right in. So was that going from Fort Dix elsewhere? Yes, I went to uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. Was this your first time off the Upper East Coast? Um, yeah, I guess I'd have to say so. Do you remember any kind of sense? Was it adventure, excitement, nervousness on your part going from Fort Dix to Fort Gordon? 
Yeah, a little bit of everything, but I knew I had an uncle in Florida and I hoped I would be able to maybe get a pass to visit him sometime, and, and I was able to. Did others in your unit at Fort Dix go with you to Fort Gordon? Yes, um, maybe a half a dozen of us at least. And, and one was a real close friend that uh, alphabet-wise we were almost uh, opposite bunk mates and we'd gotten friendly. He was from Maine, uh, Robert Harriman. And do you still keep in touch with Mr. Harriman? I haven't in some years, but uh, mentally I believe I do. <clears throat> when you were at Fort Gordon, what were your duties? Well, we'd go to school during the day training to, on teletype um, for a communication center uh, job. And um, at nighttime, we um, had to alternate um, every so many weeks. Somebody would take care of the um, fires if we needed them at that time. And we did it, if I remember right, because it was a cold season. In other words, wood stoves, uh, coal stoves. Somebody had to go around and tend those. And it was kind of an alternated duty. And that was your heat source? Pretty much, yeah. And. Um, no, I guess it didn't heat the uh, domestic hot water. I think that was uh, oil fired. But. Mm -hmm. How long were you at Fort Gordon, Georgia? Ooh, I think that was um, close to, it was 12 weeks. During that time, did you get any time off to go home or to visit areas of the south? Um, I did take one uh, weekend and went down to see my uncle in Orlando, Florida. Otherwise, you might take a um, weekend pass. And um, yeah, I, I did go to um, um, a few other parts of Georgia, I guess that was it, on w the weekends. Were the neighbors that were around Fort Gordon friendly to all of you as GIs? Not really, no. And that was in um, Augusta, Georgia. And um, there was actually a train track right down the middle separating the two colors of races. And it was a little um, touchy to um, cross over either side almost. And so you kind of stayed away from down there. I mean, they, they'd like to take your money in the bars and restaurants, but otherwise um, they weren't that friendly, no, from what I remember. Once you left after the 12 week period, did you know prior to the end of your 12 weeks that you would be going overseas? It was probably two days before I was to leave that area. We had finished all our um, classes. They put us on guard duty that night. We haven't, hadn't had any for 12 weeks. And um, after we got off, they gave us all kinds of physical training and um, lined us all up and said, guess what? You're all going to Vietnam. Was this, how, do you remember back then whether that was a surprise to you or you saw it coming? Well, we had heard rumors from um, some of the um, uh, extra duty personnel that had worked in the um, uh, orderly room cleaning up or whatnot, that there was uh, quite a pile of uh, orders had come down and it was quite well rumored that uh, every one of them was headed for Vietnam. How'd you feel about that? A little hollow. Did you have a way of notifying your family back here? Yeah, they um, gave us uh, free time once they told us and uh, everybody was just lined up at the pay phones. How much easier it is today, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yeah. Um, when you went to Vietnam, did you go over by plane? Yeah, we left um, from Fort Lewis, Washington. It was a 27-hour um, flight total. It was broken up a bit. But they used commercial airlines. It was Northwest Orient. And they were retrofitted to be refueled in midair over Washington State. And then I believe it was Japan or some, some one of those islands was the first stop. They gave us a little time out of the plane. Then we were on another plane, uh, the same plane for a short period again, and just barely enough fuel to get us to Vietnam from there. What um, month are we talking now? Um, beginning of May. 
was um, just before Mother's Day. It was my uh, <laughs> mother's worst Mother's Day, as she put it. It had to be very <clears throat> difficult for her. Mm -hmm. So this would have been May of 67. Correct. Were you assigned as soon as you landed, or did you know where you were going uh, no. to No. Um, we went to this, we, they call it a rebel depot, replacement depot. It was in Cameron Bay. Um, the Army did a lot through that area. And um, we were there for a couple of days. They, you know, just kind of let you relax. And then uh, they'd call a formation every day, call out your name. And that's how you knew when you were getting your orders to go someplace. Now, did your friend from Maine go over with you at that time also? Yeah, we were together all that time. Mm -hmm. What do you remember about the area, the weather, the scenery, the noise? Do you remember in, anything? In Vietnam mm -hmm. or the initial? Um, oh, it had an odd odor because of um, the, uh, what they burned and what not. It was um, outside of Cameron Air Base, so there was always um, uh, plain noise and a lot of vehicles uh, transporting people, goods, etc. And once you left Cameron Bay, where did you go? I ended up in Play Coup. And how do you spell that? Do you know? P L E I K U. It's in the Central Highlands. And what was the difference? in that area versus Cameron Bay, do you remember? Well, Cameron Bay was uh, more of an um, um, ocean area, and it was quite sandy. Um, the ocean was not very far. I mean, you could really see it from where we were initially, and it was just one of the prettiest blues I've ever seen, other than maybe in Aruba on the water. And um, uh, one funny incident along the way was going to play coup. We stopped in An K. And um, I, I guess they had to unload from the plane some supplies. So they, we had to get out of it. And there was um, maybe a couple dozen of us, and we're out on the runway. All of a sudden, they call us to attention. And there's this small Learjet coming. And we had to face it and salute it. And it turned out to be General West Moreland. He decided not to land, but we thought we were going to get to meet him. But at the time, what are you making us go to attention for? <laughs> yeah. You didn't even come and see us. About so that. it was General Westmoreland, and mm -hmm. at the time he was? The commanding general of that area. Mm -hmm. So you didn't see him, but you saw the plane. Yeah. yeah. So then in Play Coup, were you given duties and assignments right away? Um, we ended up, um, in, in Play Coup there is also an air base. So we were trucked from there, which is probably, um, our, half a mile from where um, I ended up. We get out of the truck onto a loading dock, which was the backside of the mess hall, which was actually a um, French compound before the uh, 43rd Signal, or Army area, took it over. And they um, pulled three or four of us aside, get over there. And the rest of them, they were, we, to, we were told we're going to go to the comm center. They were going to set them up in their um, uh, quarters and then show them their duties. They'd be back for us. About an hour later, they came back. Come on with us. You, get, you fellas have more education than the rest. You're going to get a different duty. Ooh. So I ended up in battalion control, which was um, in, in short terms, BATCON. And we had to keep status on all the communication circuits that went through that area. Now, when you talk about con communication circuits then versus now, explain to those who might be watching this exactly what kind of circuits you had to use and what you were used to. Well, most of it was transmitted through the air, um, probably within a quarter of a mile from where our um, unit actually was, was what we called Tropo Hill, and it was a sizable hill. And it had at least, uh, no, there was five tropospheric scatter antennas. These would look like um, indoor, outdoor movie theater screens, but without the actual um, screen area, the white material on it. It was just a framework of uh, metal and some kind of screen. And those were actually used to transmit uh, radio signals uh, into the, uh, t towards the troposphere 
and um, they would bounce back and go off to other areas such as Guam, um, Hawaii, and then eventually they'd be transmitted to the States. So there was five of them, and I think um, three received and two transmitted. Now also in that area there was um, ultra high frequency antennas, very high frequency antennas, microwave antennas, short band, long band. So it was quite an area of radiation and all the uh, vans that were there to house the equipment. So I always used to kid each other that we were in a, um, a manor radar oven made by the Army or something. So we hope all that radiation hasn't affected us too much. Do, has there <clears throat> ever been any testing with regards to that on any um, of you? I, I've heard stories, but I, I don't really know. But you don't feel there were any effects as well, far as? So far I seem all right. I don't glow too much at night That's or great. <laughs> And you were at that time with, you, was it the 45th Battalion? Is no, that what you it was said? 43rd Signal 43rd Battalion. 43rd Signal. Um, did you see any combat while you were there? All I saw was six rocket attacks, and they were basically spaced out. Um, after the year was over, those of us that had come over together would joke around that we were probably the OJT on the job training for the Viet Cong rocketeers, because it was cyclic almost every two months. That they would... Yeah. They, and they, they would, would they have them focused on your base? Apparently, and they uh, would always come into our area. And they were launched always from the same spot, five miles out. And uh, after the first couple of attacks, the uh, helicopter port that was um, five miles the other side would always know right where to go, and by the time they got there, there was nothing left, nothing obvious. It was always at nighttime, too. So it conceivably could have been a training. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there was no consistency. The first time I went through it, there was, um, I think, 27 rockets. Another time, there was only two or three, but they were concise. They'd hit like a trash can, a generator trailer. Why? Coincidence? Or did they really know what they were doing? Mm. And um, they'd come close to the air base, never touch it, never. They'd drop maybe two or three feet away from the end of it, the side of it. The first time it happened, was it stunning to you? Oh yeah, I was on guard duty in the motor pool, and in the middle of the motor pool was a horrendous sized French bunker that had been left behind by the French, because they were in that um, compound before we took it over. And I was standing beside a, um, what we called a deuce and a half, or a two and a half ton truck. It was a cargo truck, transport, whatever. And I heard this shh, and I said, who's whispering at me, you know? And uh, I look around and uh, I saw a flame coming towards me up in the sky. And right away it hit me, this has got to be a rocket that they've talked about. So what do you do, run to the bunker 10 feet away? No, I jumped under the truck which if it ever hit it, uh, who knows what the fuel would have done, even though it was diesel. And it landed up on tropospheric scatter hill, um, didn't do any damage. But then the rest of them, they walked it, rocked the rockets right down the street, five or six, seven, eight feet apart, right in the middle of the road, which was dirt, didn't do any damage. Are they that good or lucky? <laughs> or was it intentional? Mm -hmm. You'll never know, really. Right. And, and we weren't bothering them. We weren't doing any, we weren't fighting with them. We were just there providing support for our troops, so they didn't want us. Now, was the climate very warm when you were there? Um, yeah, it, um, what I remember was usually in the 90s. And um, we had a couple of days, and I think it was during monsoon season, where they actually had a record for that area. It got up to um, first day 112 degrees, and then it dropped 50 degrees that night. Then the next day it went up to 124 and dropped 70 degrees. I will tell you, we were cold at night. Do you feel you had the appropriate clothing to support both the heat and the cold? Yes. Yeah. You mentioned the um, hill. What was the rest of the terrain like? It was flat, plateauish, um, red clay, uh, laterite, which you see a lot of in perhaps New Jersey. 
Do you feel that your officers who were in charge um, were good leaders and treated you well? Yes, yes, very. Does anyone in particular stand out to you? Yeah, there was a Captain Blase, and he was actually from, um, I think, Everett, Mass. And he came in maybe after the first six months I was there. And he was just such a nice uh, person. And he went to Northeastern, and I had spent a couple of months there, so we had a little something in common. He was a couple of years older, obviously, but um, and just such a nice person. Off to the side, he'd always say, you can call me Jim when nobody's around. You know, so. <laughs> <clears throat> While you were there, did you have good health? I know you men mentioned earlier about having some asthma or early on asthma or bronchial problems. How about your health over there? Were you, did you have to require any kind of medical treatment at all? No, thank the good Lord, everything was fine over there. How did you hear and did you hear about the progress or the casualties of war while you were over there? There was Armed Forces Radio. I don't remember the call letters, but maybe it was um, AFR or something like that. And um, the movie that was made, Good Morning Vietnam, was real. You'd hear every morning, Good Morning Vietnam! It was real. It was a pleasure to wake up to that. And I think he left not too long after I got over there. Adrian Cronauer, I believe was the name. Were you able to go to other areas besides play coup? Did, did I didn't have any interest. I, I rode downtown once and that was enough so to, uh, to um, stop any other interest. Were any of the Vietnamese um, constantly on base where you befriended them? Or? Yes, because they did uh, work for us. We had um, uh, the women did the cleaning in our uh, barracks, did our laundry every day. Some of them worked in our um, uh, club that we had, or bar, whatever you want to call it. Canteen, I guess, is a better mm -hmm. term. Could you communicate with them? Yeah, they all spoke pretty good English. Actually, the younger um, boys that uh, helped clean the little, little trains and whatnot with the older men actually got friendly with myself because um, I was kind of their size. So they'd come up, pat me on the head, and ooh, same, same. And pat my stomach and say, ooh, buku kilo. You like us. <laughs> 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 and they were very friendly. Were you able to take any R and R rest and recreation or rest? What does R and R stand for? Rest and relaxation. Relaxation. Were yeah. you able to go? Mm -hmm. And where did you go? Um, in April of '68, my orders finally came down for Australia. Everybody else usually got it um, six months, eight months into your stay. I was beginning to wonder if I was ever going to get one. So I did. Um, uh, end up going to Australia at the very end of April. So it was like a uh, transition period with an English America knowing that soon I'd be in America. Now, April in Australia would have been the cool, winterish? Yeah, it's, it was a cooler season, fall, mm -hmm. correct, you're right. I did get to go to the beach. It was cold, but mm -hmm. I went. Mm -hmm. Did you befriend any others while you were there, or did other members of your unit go with you? I was the only one that I really remember that went there from my unit. The day I landed was Anzac Day, which is like our Veterans Day. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get to my hotel because there was a parade going on. They all grabbing me, hey, come over here, get in line, watch this parade. You're a soldier, you want to watch. Mm -hmm. I really want to go to my hotel. That's too bad. You're going to wait. Okay. <laughs> Did you march in the parade or no, just observe? No, I carrying a suitcase and whatnot. Uh, so it was nice. And then actually at the hotel, which was um, Hotel Australia, I think is where I stayed, the bartender was uh, from Oregon, had been in the service, went down there, fell in love with the place and went back. And uh, he was living there at that time permanently. Did it remind you of home? Yeah, it was an English America. Mm -hmm. And with the short hair and the real tan, um, and my Boston accent would sneak out now and then, some of the um, sh storekeepers thought I was a New Zealander and would start trying to bring up conversation with me. And then they go, oh, you're really a GI? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. 
You did not have to use weapons while you were there? Believe it or not, I didn't even have ammunition. I had an M14 um, issued to me, oh, we all did. Nobody had M16s where I was. And when you went on guard duty, they actually gave you um, a clip with um, 14 rounds in it. You had a sign for it, and they said, if you come back with any less than 14 rounds, you better have a body to bring along also. So my assumption is you came back with all of your rounds intact? As far as I know, I'm some form of alive and well. That's good. <laughs> and I do have to say, I always had a 97% feeling that I would make it safely. That's, that's a good feeling, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. um, when and So you were beginning your downtime now, uh, having come back from R&R, &R. Mm -hmm. so... Uh, can I add a little something you there sure too? You sure can. Um, and, and since the Army did all their traveling through Cameron Bay, my um, neighborhood friend from in the Air Force now was in Cameron Bay. And um, so I got to spend a little time with him. And it was one of the hardest moments in my life, leaving him behind, knowing he had um, four months left. And I was going home. But, uh, but we did have a nice time together, and uh, it was so good to see him. You know? And I could tell his mother when I got home personally, he's doing fine. That he was doing yeah. well. And he did well and mm -hmm. came home mm -hmm. intact. Yeah, he was in a very safe area. And that's so important, <clears throat> yeah. isn't it? It yeah. is difficult leaving a good friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so Cameron Bay was sort of the clearing post? Yeah, yeah. As we said in the beginning, it was the um, repo depot, replacement depot for uh, everybody. And um, I'd also like to add there on the coming home part that um, they told us you will be departing at 1 p.m. You better be at the plane at noon. If you're not on the plane by quarter off, you will not be leaving. You will wait for another day. So you know we were all there on time for that, that load. And they guaranteed us within 15 minutes we would be out of Vietnam. Um, so um, it actually took us 13 minutes. And the pilot came on and apologized. We didn't quite figure that you'd be carrying quite so much extra luggage. You must have a lot of souvenirs. Usually I do it in 10 minutes. So he said I had to go a little further and faster to get us off. And speaking of souvenirs, that kind of segues into something that you brought with you today. Would you like to show that piece? What I have here is um, a, um, would be called by us Native Americans, a quiver. We have arrows in it that are made of bamboo, and they're very, very sharp. And these are some kind of a leaf that they um, hand tied in here as a, uh, what we would use feathers nowadays for. And I actually have also a crossbow that I um, was able to send back in what we called hold baggage. It was a good sized box that they, the government provided and you could ship it back. And that is probably about two feet across on the bow part and about 18 inches long on the actual body. And it would kind of look like um, the body was made out of a two by four and they carved it and made it look fancy. And then they stained it kind of a maple color. And um, it was probably more of a souvenir. It was $15 back then and I'm sure Papa San got very rich every time he sold one. But they say these would go through a cement block at 15 feet if it was the hollow part of the block. So um, any time I go to the uh, veterans' breakfasts with the um, eighth graders, I always bring this, and they're always fascinated. I wish I could bring the bow, too, but I, I wouldn't want to chance any problems. Sure. And it's in a bamboo? Yeah, it's a tube. section of bamboo, bamboo that mm -hmm. they cut up and uh, keep it in it. And there's... Four in there? Yeah. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. When and where were you discharged? Um, Fort Lewis, Washington. And um, what they did then was a big treat. They let you out a day early. So you had to be there midnight of the 13th. And um, they had all the, well, you had to be there um, actually an hour early, the group that was going that day. And they had you all processed. You were just standing in line. And at midnight, see ya. You're now a civilian. What did you do after that? 
Well, I had been living off post for around three months because I was very lucky and made staff sergeant, which is um, an E6, in uh, two and a half years. So I was authorized to live off post. And there was an um, E5 in the orderly room who did some finagling and said that I could watch him if they, at the uh, company, 78 Signal Battalion, allowed him to live off post too, and he and, had the car. <laughs> and this was at Fort Lewis? Yes. So when you came back from Vietnam, you were stationed in Fort Lewis for a few months? No, 18 months. 18 months. Yeah. So were you still in communications in Fort Lewis? Yes. It was a signal battalion, and all we did was go to the motor pool every day, line up our vehicles, check out our equipment, and they actually said, you're just here to rest, relax, get back to being a human being, a civilized person. But we had extra duties too. We had riot control, which was if a riot ever broke out, they had a company of us trained um, to go out and quell any kind of a um, riot. Were there any at that time? None that we ever went to, and we hoped we never had to, because if it come down to it, we'd probably have to kill one of our own if they attacked us. And that's how you were really trained. And this was at a time, or was this too early for some of the um, riots and other uh, things that Yeah, they that were going were on. That, that's why this was... Nationwide, yeah, they were happening was, at that yeah. point. That's because why they were of doing anti war this. feelings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one other extra duty they gave us was um, for the whole 6th Army area, which was the West Coast, was burial detail um, the uh, rifle squad and the uh, pallbearers. And you went on some of those duties? Yeah, I went home on leave for 30 days. When I came back, they said, Guess what? You're on that. Uh, um, burial detail. Was that difficult for you because yes. these were your own yes. and some probably even younger than you? Very tough. Mm -hmm. But we found a secret, which isn't really a good secret, but you'd have a couple of beers or something before you before went. Before you it. went. Handled everything fine. Mm -hmm. So after 18 months, you were discharged. How did you get home? Did you come home to Natick? Yeah, I wasn't going to. I was going to stay um, down in California for a couple of weeks with this um, Richard Garrison uh, that I had lived off post with. But at the last minute, we both kind of looked at each other and he said, do you really want to? I'd love to have you. But I said, I know. You want to have your family all alone? Yep. And he said, I think you do too. So I uh, flew home, Northwest Orient, of course. Into Boston? Mm-hmm. And... Um, my um, uh, girlfriend at the time picked me up and I surprised my mother, which she wasn't too happy, but she did like it. She wanted some preparation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She knew I was coming. I, I said it's, I gave her a couple of dates that uh, depend on the flights. And, uh, so. when, she, when you got home, what was <clears throat> it like coming back to Natick? How did you feel about that? Well, as I said, I lived in um, South Natick and um, on Glenwood Street, right next to a cemetery. So it was a nice feeling knowing that um, I wasn't in the cemetery and walking around, and it's so peaceful and quiet down there that it was fantastic. So you were ready for some peace and quiet. Mm -hmm. When you came home, did you discuss with your uh, family or friends what went on or any issues that you had heard about that you had just as soon have forgotten? No. No, I never really said much of anything. If they didn't ask and they um, seemed somehow programmed not to, which I don't know where that came from, but they, they didn't. Did you join any unit of the military reserve when you came home? No, I didn't. I wasn't required to. Did you join any veterans organizations? Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States of America. And I was kind of lucky there because one of the past commanders of the Natick uh, Post 1274 was a neighbor a couple miles away. I'm to school with his children and whatnot. He used to visit my folks every week, I mean every uh, month while I was away. He so, did? Yeah. And you've been active in that organization? Oh yeah, very. Have <clears throat> you received any veterans benefits such as the GI Bill insurance or hospitalization benefits? Well, definitely the hospitalization through the um, VA. Um, 
and I did collect the um, mass bonus when he came back. I think it was two hundred dollars or something, or three hundred, whatever it was. Now, along with this um, hospitalization, you had mentioned prior to going on camera about um, being tested. Do you want to talk a little bit about that also? Yeah, through the um, Veterans of Foreign Wars, I had heard about the um, VA hospital in Jamaica Plain here in uh, the Boston area. I was looking for paid volunteers to participate in a PTSD study. And explain to those who may not be familiar with PTSD. That's Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. Anybody can have it. It's not just from a war. It's from any uh, traumatic experience that you may go through. So um, there's probably more walking around uh, just from everyday life, let alone having been in the service or, uh, or war. I mean, they say you get it just being in the military, let alone experience any kind of war. So you had some testing done. When was this? It's been going on probably for 10 years. It's something uh, that every so often they'll call me up and say, you qualify, would you be interested? Sure, because I really hope that I'm helping some fellow uh, male or, or female Vietnam veteran. Helping them through some of their stresses mm -hmm. by being tested mm -hmm. at the VA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Have you attended any reunions of your old outfit? No, I, I put some ads in um, various papers like the Vietnam Veterans of America uh, news, I mean uh, they have a, a, a newspaper that uh, is national and um, it was a good 10 or 15 years ago and I did get maybe five replies back from um, uh, people I had served with at the 43rd signal in Vietnam but we just never got together they were spread out all over the country how about your friend from Maine um, like I said uh, probably mentally I communicate with them but I've never followed up and I I should we I keep saying that my wife has gone online and looked up enough names that probably are him but I just haven't made the call how important to you was serving in the military? Very important. It's uh, something I think in a way everybody should do. Um, I've also told people if you don't have to, don't. But um, When you say everyone should, why? You just have a better value of life. Um, some of our fellow countries do require people to have a year or two in uh, the military and um, you just have a better uh, value system, you're a better community um, individual, you're, you're, you're more uh, in tune to what's going on in the community, you want to be part of it more. So do you feel in that respect that's how it affected your life, being more community it definitely um, fine-tuned those qualities and interests, yes. When you came back did you settle down right away? Did you take any more schooling or did you go right to work? Oh, silly me, went right to work because I wanted to make money again. And what did you do? I had um, been working for iTech Corporation and um, that stood for Information Technology. Reconnaissance was their main product. And um, at, before I went in the service, I was making cables and harnesses that were going up in the satellites that um, iTech was part of. Now that had kind of dwindled and they had bought out a small optical encoding uh, division uh, or company actually in um, Newton. And they asked me if I'd like to transfer there because where I used to work division wise was no longer existing. So I did and um, I went right into um, electrical assembly which my nerves and everything weren't quite good for now soldering etc so they needed somebody also in um, mechanical assembly in that department so i went into that say that for quite a while and then i moved on to um, the um, testing department for these products that we were making um, and then i eventually ended up in field service installing um, a digital readout on machine tools that we made there. So how long did you work for them? Oh, something like 13 years, including the three in the service, so it was probably 10 afterwards. And you settled down, married. Did you marry a local girl? <laughs> I didn't get married until I was 47. 
So it's, um, I didn't. I was free for many years. I actually lived at home until I, because I was the youngest. So I was probably 33, but it was just convenient. I was traveling all the time in the field service job. So on the weekends, at least, uh, the parents had somebody home. And actually, my sister did live across the street, too. So, so it was a real family unit in yeah. your neighborhood. Yeah. I was the youngest. I, had a, I have an older sister and an older, or had an older brother. Mm -hmm. Looking back, are there any memorable experiences, characters, or humorous experiences that you want to share with us? Well, the, the character would be this Robert Harriman from uh, Bangor, Maine. And um, he was just a character, but a good, good person. And we just seemed to hit it off right away. Um, experiences, probably the funniest one to me was in Vietnam. Uh, I was, uh, there was a canteen had opened up on top at the hill there, the tropospheric scatter hill that we talked, uh, tropo hill as we called it. And I think I'd put in two shifts that day in the battalion control. So I was kind of tired. So I went and had a few. And walking home, I decided oh, to the barracks, I'd take a shortcut down through the motor pool of the Vietnamese. Well, thank God they're the same height as I am because I walked right into one of their um, pits where they would drive the trucks over. Fell and, in? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was funny at the time. <laughs> you didn't get hurt? No, not that I know of. Um, seem okay. <clears throat> Is there anything additionally or a comment or a thought that you would like to leave us with for individuals, including family members, who may be watching this tape in the future? Um, this is the best country in the world, and the only way we're going to keep it that way is uh, keeping our military strong, unfortunately, because war really isn't nice. And, and unfortunately, it seems to be something that we haven't all learned how to be at inner peace. And when we do, we'll have world peace. Well, I want to thank you, David Jocelyn, for a wonderful interview. Thank you for coming in. My pleasure.